presents an inspiring gospel reflection by Father Michael Sparrow. Father Michael is a Jesuit priest working as a writer and retreat master at the Bellarmine Jesuit Retreat House outside Chicago. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the Pharisees, There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and feasted sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And from the netherworld, where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus at his side. He cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are in torment. Moreover, between us and you, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. He said, then then I beg you, Father Abraham, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, Oh, oh, no, Father Abraham. But if someone from the dead, if someone from the dead comes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord Bishop Barron was uh, the director for my doctoral of ministry thesis, and I continue to listen to him regularly and be taught by him. In his commentary on this gospel, he actually quoted Pope Benedict as saying, the Catholic Church really exists to do three things, to evangelize, to praise God, and to care for the poor. I think that's an apt summary of what the church is about, to evangelize, to proclaim the good news, to praise God, and to care for the poor. And different popes, emphasize different aspects of that gospel. Pope John Paul emphasizing evangelization. Pope Benedict emphasizing proper prayer and liturgical reform. And there's no question that the heart of Pope Francis's papacy is care for the poor. Matter of fact, I don't think Pope Francis can give a homily without referencing care for the poor. It's the hallmark of his papacy. I had the occasion on a number of occasions to hear Mother Teresa uh, 
preach, and as part of my own Jesuit tertianship, I work with the Missionaries of Charity. Um, Mother Teresa, in a similar way, could not talk about her ministry without referencing the obligation that we have to care for the poor. And in our readings here today, especially from the first reading from Amos and this very discomforting gospel from Luke, we have hard-hitting direct evidence of the core of our relationship with God is in direct relationship to our care for the poor. We simply cannot say that we love God if we neglect care for our brothers and sisters in need. In commenting on this gospel, I remember listening to a homily by Dr. Martin Luther King where he was talking about this gospel. And he said, the sin of the rich man who is unnamed, we call him Dives, which is simply Latin for rich man, there's an interesting irony here that so often we name, we know the names of the rich and the powerful and we don't know the names of the poor, but there's this divine reversal going on here in today's gospel where we know the name of the poor man, Lazarus, and we don't know the name of the rich man. He's this unnamed rich man. In Dr. King's commenting on this gospel, he said the sin of the rich man it's not that he did anything wrong. He's not stealing. He's not lying. He's not a blasphemer. He doesn't say that he's an adulterer. Presumably, he's obeying all of the commandments. So he's not guilty of not doing anything wrong. He's guilty of not doing anything right. He neglects the corporal works of mercy. He is blind to the poor man at his feet. And he doesn't share what he has. He feels entitled to what he has. I've worked hard for my money. I made good investments. I was prudent. God helps those who help themselves. God has rewarded me with a rich life. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have bestowed. And would you motivate those poor, lazy ones who are not getting along as well as I am? And if they came to me for any stock tips, I'd be happy to share my knowledge to them. I think Dr. King is absolutely right. The sin of, of the rich man is that he feels entitled to what he has and feels no obligation to share with those in need. That is not Catholic social teaching. Catholic social teaching has that everything that we have is a gift from God. And if God has blessed us with material abundance, then it's our obligation. It's not a work of superabundance. It is our obligation to share what God has given to us to make of this world a better place. And if we do not do that, Today's parable could not be more clear. There will be hell to play. A parallel gospel to this is in Matthew chapter 25. It's the last judgment scene. You're familiar with that. It shows up uh, one uh, uh, and is part of the cycle on the feast of, of Christ the King at the end of the liturgical year is this scene where all the nations of the world are presented before Christ the King and he divides them into sheep and goats and the criteria is whether they did the corporal works of mercy, whether they fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited the imprisoned, buried the dead, welcomed those who were strangers. This ring that I wear was given to me by my brothers and sisters at my ordination. And I was ordained the day before the Feast of Christ the King. I celebrated my first Mass on the Feast of Christ the King. And as providence would have it, that gospel of Matthew 25 was the gospel at my first Mass. 
And so I asked to have inscribed in the center of the ring, Lord, when did we see you hungry? And I wear that on my finger as a reminder of my first mass and of this gospel. And notice that both those who are saved and those who are lost ask the same question, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Mother Teresa never tired of saying, Christ hides himself in the distressing disguise of the poor. Christ hides himself in the distressing disguise of the poor. When she sent her sisters out and they would come back after ministering to the dying in the streets of Calcutta or throughout the world, they, she would say, how have you seen the face of Christ? It's hard to find a saint who was not compassionate toward the poor. The danger is we isolate ourselves, we insulate ourselves in gated communities, in segregated communities, so that we're protected, so that we don't have to interact with those who make us uncomfortable because they look different than us, or they smell different than us, or their socioeconomic background is different than us. So we isolate ourselves. One of the great gifts of my Jesuit education and Jesuit experience is we're mandated to go outside our comfort zone. It's part of our training, we have to do it. Get outside your culture, interact with people who don't look like you, who don't act like you, who don't think like you, who don't pray like you, who don't have the privileges that you have. It changes your worldview. Just as if we gaze up to the heavens and we get some sense of the immensity of the universe that God has created. So we're also called to walk upon this earth and to interact with people who are radically different than ourselves. And in doing so, our vision is changed. If we simply interact with those who look like us, think like us, act like us, how do we call ourselves Christian? There have been several surveys that have said that Catholics are no better than the rest of the population in terms of thinking outside our comfort zone. If you're a Democrat and a Catholic, you think like a Democrat and a Catholic. If you're a Republican and a Catholic, you think like a Republican and a Catholic. That's a sad commentary on the ability of the gospel to slap us in the face and to say, I'm sorry, the Democratic party does not represent the fullness of Catholic social teaching. I'm sorry, the Republican Party does not represent the fullness of Catholic social teaching. There are some areas in which the Democrats are much closer to Catholic teaching and there are some areas in which the Republicans are much closer. But the sad reality of those surveys is that if you're a Democrat, you just agree with those areas that are part of the Democratic platform. And if you're a Republican, you just agree with those parts of the platform that, that the Republicans, but you know, I don't, I don't want to pay attention to the Democrats. I don't want to pay attention to those Republicans. We're Catholics, we're Christians. And the sad reality is we don't think outside our boxes. Jesus addressed this parable to the religious elite, to the Pharisees and presumably also to the Sadducees. And they read the scripture and they prayed, but their reading the scripture and their praying did not impact their living in the ways that would change them radically. It simply reinforced them in terms of their own prejudice. There's good religion and there's bad religion. Good religion comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. Bad religion afflicts the afflicted and comforts the comfortable. What's your religion? <laughs> 
if you come Sunday after Sunday and you just feel like, wow, I'm doing such a good job. <laughs> and I don't know about all the rest of them people that is, are going to hell, but I'm on my way like a bullet up, <laughs> up to the stars, straight up. Think again. Hopefully, when we hear these Gospels, it makes us uncomfortable. Read the prophets. Read the prophet Amos. Read the lives of the saints. And know that they did not consider the gifts that they were given as rewards for a just life. The saints are those who saw whatever gift was given to them is an opportunity to share and to make Christ more manifest within the world. That's our call as Christians. If more of us did that, I think the evangelization would take care of itself. How did the Christian church grow so rapidly in the midst of persecution for the first 300 years? It's because the Christians lived differently. The Romans couldn't give two nickels for the poor or the afflicted. The gospel was a radical change because they reached out to the poor. They reached out to the needy. And we need to do that individually and we need to do that corporately. I just read yesterday in the New York Times that a large Christian hospital system is under investigation right now because they were trying to get money out of the people that they should be, that are entitled to free health care. Because hospitals are hurting, so you know we got, the institution has to survive, and even though they're entitled to free health care and we get tax benefits as a result of our mission to care to the poor, they're not doing it. Because COVID has hit hospital institutions like everybody else. And so you got to survive on the bottom line. And if that means cheating the poor out of some money, well, so be it. We, we got to survive. And you call yourself a Christian healthcare system? Just do away with it. Say we're not, we're not a nonprofit. We're for profit. We gotta survive like everybody else. But don't call yourself Christian and neglect the poor. Don't call yourself Catholic and be ignorant of Catholic social teaching. This is the hard hitting message of the gospel that the saints live. Does that make you uncomfortable? It certainly makes me uncomfortable living here in Barrington Hills, living in this shack of a retreat house, <laughs> on this postage stamp of property. I got it tough, let me tell you. Amen. Amen. Heart. Gospel.